It's a great pleasure for me uh, to present our next uh, keynote speaker, Professor Miguel Coimbra from the University of Porto. Uh, I have to say that I was one year ago uh, working on his laboratory. It was a very good method for very for seeing me there. Uh, so Professor Coimbra is one of the founders of the IT portal. He was working on the IT portal. I think you since last few months maybe you changed that. Yeah, uh, so, so now I'm at the Rifles. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, two big engineering uh, research institutes in Portugal. One is the Telecom System. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Portal delegation, and I was there for 10 years. And I moved to the, to the opposing side. So now we're in the thing. In the in the in the That's in the 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 those guys. Okay, okay, okay. I'll give a brief description. Yeah. Yeah. So he's current uh, the chair of uh, the Portugal chapter of the Academy uh, He's the director of the Master of Medical Information. Uh, was was okay, <laughs> and he also is an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of uh, IS4H Interactive System for Healthcare, uh, spin-off from the University of Porto, and he leads projects in the medicine and engineering uh, field. And I know him because of his long experience in biotechnology, so we come from the same uh, field. <laughs> so I leave you with Professor Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo. It's, it's very exciting for me to be here. Um, uh, this, I, I guess this all started when, because of my ethical ego, uh, and I invited Michael to go there as a distinguished lecturer, and I was very sad because the guy is doing surgical stuff, and I'm not, so I'm bringing this distinguished lecturer, and I'm not going to be able to work with him, and I was very wrong, and I realized there was all this work on acoustic signal processing, which was affiliated with some of the stuff we're doing on auscultation, as you'll see, for example. And um, a few researchers have been there at Porto, here I am talking, and we have papers together, and actually a best paper of which will be very, very proud. And a lot of times you will need papers, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so that's a good, a good postcard, right? We can link next to this distinguished lecture program that we're now working together. But that, that's really great. And, and so what, uh, what I would like to talk here, uh, Today is is not again not formulas and not you know not by the basics of research. I uh, you know I have great students to do that, great postdocs, great etc. And I'm here to tell a bit of my experience of working on this signal processing in biomedical engineering, um, all in underprivileged underprivileged areas, namely Brazil. You know, I've been working for ten years with Brazil, twelve years now, and we learned a lot. You know, we learned that it's not only mathematics. It's of the real world that really affects the way we can create an impact. And I'll share some of those stories here with you today, hopefully um, to avoid making some of the mistakes I did and, uh, and to motivate you that it's really um, challenging and, and rewarding to work on these situations. Okay, So my outline is, I, I'll you know, talk a little bit about Porto, my university, my research institute. Okay, We're on the very far away on the other side, on that corner of Europe, and uh, maybe you don't know much, but you know, I'll just give a brief introduction there, you know, and then speak very briefly about hospitalization in these underprivileged scenarios, and then tell about our 12 years of experience there, okay? So, <clears throat> so there we go, the, the, we have that country there on the, on the corner, and Porto is the second largest city in Portugal, with roughly one million people, um, and, uh, you know, as you can see by the photo, I'm in love with this city, you know, and it's it's a it's a nice city. Uh, not only research-wise, I'll give you a brief. It's a promotional video of the university, but it's much better than on my slides, so I'll show you very quickly. But it's a nice city, and it's safe. Uh, it'll be one of few times the best European destination. Okay, and so it's it's a, it's been a nice work environment. Um, let me then, you know, introduce very quickly to the to the university. This is a Promotional video from the Porto sits in the top 1% of internationally recognized by the quality and depth of its teaching and research. As a comprehensive university, we offer courses in all study areas and all levels of higher education, from undergraduate to postgraduate programs. Reasons more than enough to be the preferred university in Portugal by national and international students. A community of more than 30,000 that choose the University of Porto to develop their career path or a research project. 
now stand out as the largest producer of science in Portugal, authoring 25% of all the scientific papers published every year. In our research units, you may find some of the most productive and renowned European R&D centers. Consequently, the University of Porto is a driver for innovation, helping students and researchers turn ideas into new products, services, and companies. Hundreds of startups and thousands of new jobs were created in our premises, affirming Porto as one of the most innovative regions of Europe. Moreover, all this is done in one of the most beautiful regions and cities of the world, voted as best European destination. The city of Porto is itself an attraction, booming with life and culture, and we at the University of Porto would welcome you with open arms. So sorry for the commercial pitch. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is from the team, but hey, that number there, so thanks for nice videos. But that's not the point. The point is to give a bit of a profile of what we are at Okay, as you know, we have had a, a deep, profound financial uh, crisis in our country, and so we really needed to transform the way we perceived research and start seeing it through innovation eyes. And so, what didn't happen before was technology transfer, and now we have a booming scenario of startups, spin-offs, etc. We don't have big companies, so we are very keen on working with the big European companies like you know, the OMC and the OMC is tomorrow. Okay, but we have an exciting startup scene where all this research we are now uh, we now think twice before embarking on a project to see if we'll be able to do this. Okay, so it's a, it's an exciting place to be at the time of there. Okay, so what, where I'm doing research is at the Tech, so in Portugal where half our time is teaching jobs, and then the other is a, as a researcher. And you can do this research in a different uh, research centers. At the moment, I, I changed. I'm now at the Tech, because two big engineering institutes in Portugal, around a thousand researchers, including good master students, for example. Uh, one is focused on telecoms a lot, and spread throughout the country. Tech is more focused on the north of the country. And uh, it's very, I mean, this is, a, this is a distribution of the centers. And as you see, this reflects the, a bit the old Portugal because it's, um, it's focused on technical areas. Maybe it's, maybe it's a good organization. Okay, but that means each individual research center is not really thinking about societal challenges and, and places where we can really make an impact with innovation. So we created this orthogonal lines called the Tech Force, Tech for Energy, Tech for Health, Tech for Agro Food, and they invited me to coordinate it with Tech for Health areas so make it more visible, make it grow, create opportunities for it. So it's an exciting challenge. It's divided into various groups and yeah, that's that's the, the, the all the all the things that are happening in Tech in Portugal. So what we've been focusing on as competences that we can contribute to, to this field, the big teams are in A, artificial intelligence, information systems and devices, okay, and the key areas that we've been working on is cancer, cancer is a big thing, uh, we're working on a lot of different types of cancer disease screening, and I'll, I'll talk about that today, uh, and neuroengineering. So lots of, lots of, um, uh, some of the pedigree, for example, the, the most recent IEP health prize was won by Porsche's company, a spin-off of, of Inesh Tech, you know, for Parkinson's disease, uh, we have other companies coming out of that software patents, which is something new uh, at Inesh Tech and in Portugal we haven't been doing any software patents, but we're now aggressive and going for that. Um, maybe learning with Michael, to, <laughs> to, which has uh, all these impressive number of patents. And uh, you know, there's all these different fields that we've been working Okay, uh, some ongoing H2020 projects, going aggressively for next H2020 calls, and hey, looking. We're all European partners in the audience. If we, uh, we, are, we are working for you. <laughs> okay, so that was the presentation. You know the environment where I come from. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this has been my passion. Transportation in other privileged centers. Okay, and I really, uh, we have this uh, event called Science in Portugal where we, we bring the politicians within the academics within the society to talk about you know the, the most recent. Outbreaks and uh, the most recent advances of science in Portugal, and and I realized I'm working uh, ever since science 1816. That's when the stethoscope was developed. Right? So why it's not that? Well, it's been mutating, and I think it will keep on mutating. Um, and this is well, 
Science 2019 is actually a lie, and it's Science 2014. It's this researcher thinking he's a doctor doing testing his prototypes in non Um But I think that's that's you know important. We're going to the field and understanding. So why transportation? Why do we still bother with that? Um, cost effectiveness. Okay, I think we all know for some is better. We all know um, better devices will come up and etc. But um, we may, we can't make the mistake that cost effectiveness is not uh, important. Okay, uh, transportation is part of the physical examination. We do it all the time. So if we use that to screen better, for example, if that person is doing an echocardiogram or not, then uh, it, it's it's a very important step. Okay, and then of course pulmonary disease. Okay, <clears throat> but uh, something very interesting that happens that with all these uh, trend of ultrasound. You know, uh, there's some very interesting studies from Salvatore Maggioni from um, uh, Philadelphia Medical College that tells you, you know, what that question you read, how many graduate students, okay, we can tell tuition in your mind, we are graduating all these medicine, medicine students, okay, how many of them do you think in your mind actually know how to perform a cardiac transplantation? Okay. Why are you excited? Who? Why are you excited? Bing! Boom! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That is four out of five, and they took it, those young doctors who took the status in their chest. Mm -hmm. They actually don't know very well what they do. Okay. But this this is uh, it's, it's pretty hard. Okay. It's not that simple. It requires a lot of training, and so they're, they're stuck to do that. And um, if you, you, I was not really convinced. I actually started working in this in 2007, and my wake up call was Brazil. Okay. We, uh, Strong relationship with Brazil, as you can imagine. We speak the same language, we have a lot of affinity, cultural affinity, a lot of historical uh, partnerships, and then the CIF, uh, that's the small corner of Brazil, it's the sixth largest city in Brazil, more or less 4 million people. Okay, and they talk to us and say, hey, we have a problem. Okay, but okay, let's work together. Okay. And actually, a lot of the work that I'll, that I'll talk about is on the neighboring state of uh, as if the, the state that is called Pernambuco, okay, and then the neighboring state on, just on the north is called Paraíba. That's 4 million people live there, 40,000 children are born every year, okay. And this is the 2014 draft of the telemedicine uh, network that was created to screen all these children. Okay, I'll talk more about it, but essentially in 2012, when it started, no single physician in the state of Paraíba could do an echocardiogram, okay? So that means all those kids, you cannot screen them with that. And uh, almost none could do auscultation properly also. Okay, so uh, there, there's all these kids just being born, and hey, some survive, some don't. And when you find things, they're usually pretty serious and require surgery. So this is the situation in, 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 in these regions of the globe, okay? This is one that I can talk about because I've been there and I've been working with that. But, most of the time it's like that. It's not like Europe or, 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 or North America, for example. Okay, so this is the hospital, uh, the hospital. This is the largest hospital in Northeast Brazil. It's been our partner and our inspiration. This is their team, the Heart Circle team. They, they've been working for years on that. And we do a bit of technology. They, they are the ones that save lives. We help a bit, or we try to help a bit, but it's been a, a, a fascinating experience. Okay, this is 2013. Hey, Doctor there, and uh, this is actually part of our team too. Okay, and and yeah, it's 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 been a partner ever since. Okay, so so this is an privileged Paraíba. So we've participated on some of these actions. Okay, so these are some of the photos we took, and of uh, the places where we went there to screen the kids. And it was you know um, sometimes schools that they emptied just for the screening operation. Uh, sometimes primary care centers where they didn't even have a nurse, they had a health technician, which is someone that has three weeks of training and has to solve all the health problems there. Okay, and this is the type of population that lives on these areas that, you know, very quickly has um, a lot of problems and they, a lot of these kids that you see here have never seen a doctor in their lives. Okay, uh, which, is, which is, you know, <laughs> unthinkable for those Europeans. 
Okay, and this is us trying to do something with technology here, also protecting a baby, here also protecting a child, okay? But this is, uh, this is uh, our job, okay? And, and a, a really cool challenge um, uh, because it's a, it's a health challenge and it's part, parts of the planet where really technology can make a difference because where it's really lacking behind in capacity, you know, performing good health care. Okay, so how can we use technology to screen cardiac disease in this environment? There's a lot of disease there, we have been working on cardiac disease, okay? So this led to our, to our dishes scope line. Okay, so he was working on this and, um, you know, now we have a mature idea of what's going on, okay? But um, there's a big team, not so many people have contributed to this and, uh, you know, I, I, I was, uh, this slide was, few years back and I said, well, oh, there's a lot of things missing. I started writing, writing, writing. And I said, mm -hmm. I hope I don't miss any. I probably did. Okay, but this is, you know, highly multidisciplinary. I mean, if I work here, uh, we can have, you know, pediatric cardiologists, well, computer scientists, scientists, computer scientists. This is uh, Mark Conway from Queen Mary University of London, so he's from Brazil. Okay, and then we, at some point we have biomedical engineers, we have uh, Cardiopulmonary technicians, uh, speech therapy, even, you know, it goes multidisciplinary very quickly if you want to address these challenges. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is our, the, the, the guiding line of our, our uh, research line. Okay, there's this tool which nobody is really using, electronic stethoscopes, okay, which have all these technical abilities. We can record sound, transmit sound, process sound, you know. What? problems are there in reality that this basic tool could uh, help and what we need to develop to help those problems, okay? So we start with this capacity of this technology, then we go back to the field, look at what problems are there, and then we try to get solutions. And, you know, uh, we, we work on three areas, telemedicine, okay? How can we promote that an electronic health record can be made with quality and reproducibility? You know, in these underprivileged areas using technology. Okay. Then the other one is uh, capacity building, so teaching. Can we use this technology? What can we teach people? Okay. We, we think a lot of artificial neural nets, but that's biological neural nets. Okay. We can train people. People are really good at learning. Okay. And so we've been working on this educational line, you know, how to use these tools to actually train people to. And then, of course, computer assisted decision algorithms, AI, and then uh, hopefully have these guided decision systems that help us screen people uh, uh, much better. Okay, so that has been the... Okay, so, um, well, <clears throat> it all started in 2007. And as you see, it's very impressive, okay? Wow. Okay, this is actually the reason why I work on this field. Okay, this is, uh, this is, uh, was handcrafted by uh, by uh, this, this engineer called Fabio Edayolo, okay? He was the informatics engineer for five years on the Real Hospital Português, and the problems there with hospitalization were so big that the doctor was saying, please, create an electronic stethoscope that can record sounds, and so we can use those sounds to train people, understand the pathologies that we have here on the field, okay? And then we'll bring people here, they'll listen to the sounds, they'll learn, okay? So he actually crafted this, okay? He, um, he didn't know acoustics, so he studied and he created that part. He didn't know electronics, so he studied and he created that box and then. And so he obtained this, it was interesting, but it was very noisy. So he discovered that, that we have this mastery in medical informatics back in Porto. And, uh, and there was this single processing guy who was with Joe Weaver said, single processing guy, hey, maybe you can help me reduce the noise, because this is very noisy. So I said, yes, we wrote the scholarship together, I forgot about that, and then one year later he enters my uh, office in 2007, say, hey, I'm Fabio. Fabio? Yes, I was a guy from Brazil. Oh, okay, and I did this. Okay, and he puts these and he tells me this. You know? and, and for me, that was the, the click. Uh, if, if there is this pressing need that someone actually goes to the effort of crafting this, maybe, you know, we can do something here. Okay, that's how, how important this is for them in Northeast Brazil, which I didn't really know I mean. I didn't need transfer parts of Brazil, I didn't even know this. Okay, so this is, is an important moment. And then, of course, um, you know, Fabio was very excited. He worked a few years, that he learned a lot. And 
go, oh, that's great. So what's our next step? We go. Well, the next step is you're going to pick it up and you're going to throw it away. And we're going to start over. And then you think, you're going, wow, oh, come on. Yeah, well, there's better, there's better devices on the market, okay? You've convinced me, okay? This is great. Let's go. And then we start working and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about, uh, about streaming in these environments. I didn't know much about transportation. I didn't know much about the heterism. Okay, so uh, we have this technical challenge as an engineer to say, hey, I need a device that during the detectorism is able to record a transportation signal before, during, or after. Okay, so essentially we had an electronic stethoscope and we wanted to create, uh, uh, put this uh, uh, with an audio voice or impedance, etc. Let's use it with a laptop to store the sounds and then uh, record these sounds with the correctoration and the annotation, etc. And <clears throat> I honestly thought uh, in 2008 that this would solve the job. Okay? You can probably guess, if you know your, what the catheterism is, you can probably guess and how many people are in the room and how chaotic it is and how all those wires can mess up with the thing. Okay? The, uh, uh, amazing number of recordings we did uh, uh, during the catheterism was, and you know, yes, none. Okay, we had some excellent results on, on the on the laboratory, and this worked really nice. And that's you know, study of the environment first, learn as much as you can. Okay, you identify there is a problem, great. You will not solve your engineering problem just by crafting a fence, something that you think it works. Can go there, go to the field, do your studies. Okay? Uh, if they have to be ethnographic, so be it. Spend as much time as you need, but you need to really understand the field for that. So, of course, but this was uh, enough uh, to convince uh, people, funding entities of our motivation. So, the FCT is our National Science Foundation in Portugal. Okay? And they trusted us, inexperienced in the field, you know, with zero publications on exploitation signal processing, and they actually grant us. 100,000 euros to do research on that. And this was a massive process. We finally had resources to start doing some, some, uh, some interesting things. Okay? So this is our first follow-up work to us. Okay? That, that's 2010. Okay? Um, we have it, but there was already this you know, touch base transformer laptops okay, with assistive uh, screens. And said, hey, we can use them. There's no wires. We actually changed the technology from Bell to uh, to uh, to, uh, to uh, well, Whitman um, because it had a Bluetooth, Bluetooth connection. Okay, we start developing a bit the interface, and this one was good. Okay, we recorded you know hundreds of proper auscultations on that um, on controlled environments, of course, to our clinical environments, but we were present, and you know they didn't use this without us, but. A lot of it was used then for our research, and we actually launched an international challenge. One of the public databases used now, okay, it's called the Pascal database because it was a Pascal challenge. We crafted it in, and it was collected in Brazil with technology from Porto and last uh, last EMBC, just in, well here in Germany, in Berlin, there was a session on hospitalization, and you know almost all of them used this dataset. So that's the dataset from technology collected and you know, crafted in 2010. Okay, but it was it was pretty solid and interesting uh, and enabled us to, to do this work. Okay. And and then something happened. Okay. The fact that we started you know getting all this stuff and uh, and the technology working on the field and it is in hospitals and doctors talking about it, um, it suddenly became news. Okay, and we appeared in national television, in newspapers, and etc. Which is something, I mean, if you're an academic, this is something you, 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 you will get. It's like, no way. My peers respect science and papers. I'm not appearing on TV. Okay? <laughs> but the fact is that a lot of people that fund your science, that accept your technology, don't mean your papers. And TV is gone. And this is, this is horrible, but it's true. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, if one advice, you know, and one of the take of Messages is use the media, okay? Use it well, uh, you know. Do not use it for the, you know. Use it 
for, 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 for good purposes, okay, when it really gives you, uh, you know, uh, power. One of the things I, I uh, talk about is, uh, uh, for me personally, it dealt with that. It was a, a landmark moment for me because uh, my family uh, came to me after seeing the music. Like, wow, Miguel, you actually woke. <laughs> it's like, I have all these papers and all these challenges and all these partners and technology in Brazil. And you know, and they get respect out of this. Even the, the person that I go to the cafe to get the toast, and I think the toast is hot, oh, this is so empty, it's going to work. And I think the toast is going to Anyway, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, do not, if you are, uh, you lose your inhibitions, you know, because I had some inhibitions, like, oh, yeah, this is TV, you know, it's, you use it well, but uh, it, it's, it's important. Okay, and then there's some fun stuff. Okay, this is, this is Fabio, okay, Fabio was the, the guy that crafted that status quo, okay, he's, he's, he's then he joined me in London for a sabbatical and we were working with Queen Mary and, and it was interesting, it's Queen Mary um, uh, had a lot of, it was a digital music group by, directed by Mark Conway and Mark Sandler at the time. This was state of the art research worldwide, okay, this is an amazing group and we said we're a very quiet group, let's go to a more theoretical group because we need to improve our theory, okay, so that's why we chose it. And then uh, suddenly the yeah, BBC uh, wanted to make a report about their work, and their work was just too theoretical. So Mark was like, okay, maybe can we use DigiSchool there because we're cooperating? He's like, sure, just go there, and, you know. And so uh, he didn't tell me it was for um, uh, BBC World, for, uh, for Arabic countries, okay, and so someone called this Global School. So, so that's a Brazilian research because Pablo's Brazilian, okay, from Turkish descendants, his parents are Turkish, okay, he was working in Portugal, but he was talking in England to an Arabic television. Like, oh, okay, we went cool. Uh, this, is, this, is, yeah, this is interesting. Okay, and Tablets appeared, and, and Tablets actually made big difference because ah, it's just fancy. No, it was a huge impact. Okay, we still use the same malignant stethoscope, okay, but Tablets. Uh, and and, and for, for interesting reasons, okay? Um, possibly the most important one is that, let's, uh, I'll give you some, uh, some, some seconds to think why, why was talent so important. And it was not, for, not all talent, for example, the 10 inch talent was not really important, but the 8 inch talent was amazing. Again, visibility, and seeing people work in the okay? Because a stethoscope you put here, hands free. The computer you don't, but the 8 inch tower you put in your pocket. Okay? So that means you could carry it anywhere. And the problem with other prototypes that they will limit here, and then as you know, clinical art is come off. Okay, you can't really control the technology, so I don't know where I left it, so if you don't use it. Okay, so this was the big transition in 2012 and the, the let's say the technical part was ready. So we really went to the field this time and now Brazil. Okay, and this is Campina Grande. So Campina Grande is the is the capital of Paraíba, that's state in the blue region. And we started doing proper tests now with neonates here, uh, for example, recording all this information. We started doing other tests with because uh, we we're already thinking education at the time. So we started developing a way that I'm listening to transportation, but by using rules, I can transmit sound to another stethoscope. So several doctors were listening to the same thing. And they could be discussing, okay, uh, and the clinical case because this would help the training of untrained doctors, okay. So we were testing all this technology, and in 2013 we said we're ready, okay, this is gonna work. And we trained uh, that sister, that's a nurse, okay. We trained sister. We uh, we have that technology there, and the technology was integrated in two big actions, okay. One is called Heart Caravan 2013, 434 hospitations. The other was the Camp Run project, where they, they, this is a region of that state where they went to all the schools and they screened all the kids in the schools. And we got 3,000 hospitations there. And we went, wow, our technology is amazing. Thousands of hospitations obtained. And then we received all the data. And then the data was rubbish. Okay? 
it was noisy, it was uh, recorded in the incorrect spots. We were not really sure if that was the spot or the other was the spot. I said, oh, engineering again, we thought the technical problem was solved. But then we now realize is that, well, I think Cicero did uh, a lot of efforts, but then kids are screaming and mothers are asking, and then there's too many kids, not enough time, and then chaos brings in and she was doing it, doing it. Okay, so we said, well, let's go for the usability part. And we really started uh, incorporating proper human computer interaction. Research and design within our research because it was, it was we really need to motivate that. You know, we, we essentially failed here at creating a reproducible electronic health record with this technology. We had to really force something to make this happen. Okay, so we spent a lot of time, there's the other one, you know, listening and transmitting sounds. So we spent a lot of time doing that, and in 2013 was uh, also another crazy idea came about. We were really thinking, you know, um, uh, training is very important, capacitation is very important. So this idea actually comes from this guy. Okay, this is Daniel. Okay, Daniel was uh, he still is. Gosh, a PhD student. Okay, in my group. And then he you knows the, the one with the crazy disruptive ideas, okay? And he comes to me and he says, yeah, well, look, we have this uh, really cool system to record auscultation sounds, you know, divided by spot, okay? So with additional information from the patient, fine, it doesn't work with untrained personnel, but we can create a nice data set. So what do you think? Okay, and then we have problems with training, okay? And the way we train the students at hospitals, etc., we need patients. They need to go there for other repetitions. Okay, according to Michael Barrett, you need 500 repetitions per type of murmur to follow the learning. How can we ensure this? It's impossible. Okay, so we said, well, what if we create a virtual torso? Okay, we have a way that the electronic stethoscope can act as a pointer. Okay, we know where it touched. Okay, and we reproduce the correct side. Okay, so you actually also take a virtual patient by literally touching the stethoscope and then you miss it. So you usually do that. So what do you think, Miguel? I said, no way, that's too risky. Uh, I, I, I don't have a team to develop that. So I can check the idea. So yeah, that's too crazy. Okay. I'm glad you proved me wrong. Okay. So he said, well, and again, the advantage of having proper human computer interaction. Uh, Routines there. I said, well, can I do a twist try with low fidelity prototyping, discounting probation methods, show the results and prove you that you should allocate resources to this project? Well, fine. And he showed me some incredible results, uh, promising results. And I actually decided to shift most of our development from, from telemedicine to this, uh, to develop this tool. Okay, and the tool is that, you know, a few years, we actually created a product out of this, a product that Auto and then Canada, France, etc. Okay, and thanks to that paper prototype and that uh, 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 investment and that resilience of Daniel to try to think completely out of the box. Okay, this was not our goal, but it was interesting. And then again, media and a center fold in our national newspaper. Okay, and I still keep it. I don't know if I'll ever have another center fold in the national newspaper, so, um, so it's cool. Okay, but. This was a, a sidetrack, okay, and let's get back to the screening in the in the in Paraíba. So continuing our, our experiences and the stories of 2014, again, a very important moment for us and for our team and for me. Okay. In 2013, if you remember, we integrated technology where they screened those 400 kids. Okay. At this time, this was already in setup. Okay, this is called the the, cardio, the, the pediatric cardiology biomedicine network between Pernambuco and Paraíba. Okay, there's 40,000 kids, one in Paraíba, and the hospital nearby created a three-layer telemedicine network where the first layer in all those centers there, the first level centers, you would do several uh, physiological measurements, you would do proximity, hopefully auscultation, but they needed us to, to help with the, tech, with the technical part there, and sometimes the ECG. Okay? If something suspicious was about, you move to level two. This only appeared on those ones in blue, okay, which were the three centers that had an ultrasound machine and did not have anyone qualified to use it. 
So they actually had to transport the kid there, okay? And then using the other school machine, they actually put it on an iPad facing the screen, okay? And they had a video connection there, and then we're doing the, the exam and do it, and doing this like that. And then the third model, they would uh, uh, transport it to the surgery, so they had to transport it to the hospital. Okay, so we start working with them on the, on the first level, but this only started in 2012, 2013, so all the older kids had not been screened, not even once, uh, before with, uh, for cardiac disease. Okay, so they had what they call the heart camera, which is a bit like a rock band. Okay, it's, you know, 13 cities in 13 days. Our routine was an hour means a bus with 40 people, 37 health professionals and three engineers, yes. okay. um, where the goal was to arrive at the location, and these locations at night, okay, wake up 6 a.m., uh, breakfast, whatever, arrive at the place, usually a school that was or, 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 or a primary care center that was empty just for us at that time, have one hour to set up all the technology, that means nine screening stations, let's see if I have this slide, uh, that's fine. Um, nine screening stations, most we, you know, doctor stuff, okay, our station, a Wi-Fi, and so each of these kids would actually register and then go to each of these stations and then a new atomic record was being created and then when they reached the Sandra the, the, the head pediatric cardiologist, she had all the information there and she did the diagnostic over there. So she diagnosed 100 kids per, per day, okay? And uh, that's eight hours a day, usually you did no lunch, okay? And then you finish, you wrap things up, okay? You went to the bus, you travel, 100, 200 kilometers, but that's in Northeast Brazil roads, which means three hours of dirt roads and very hot, and then mosquitoes and all this stuff, okay? And then you arrive there and you're stinky, and you're tired, you think you have to wake up very early in the morning and you say, I'm going to sleep on this dodgy hotel, okay? But, uh, but then you realize that as soon as you arrive there, the city, the town is full of balloons, and the mayor is waiting for you because that's the biggest event in the day. So you go for dinner, and then you go to the mayor's house, and then you go for caipirinha, okay? And then you sleep three hours, and you do it again the next day, okay? So, what an experience. Uh, you know, I, after 30 days, I lost five kilos, and, and doctors were very nice. Yeah, so, uh, and, you know, I think engineers are much less, less resistant than doctors, or at least they have the training, okay? This is very intense. But a thousand kids were screened there, and we uh, we really tested our technology to promote the creation of the electronic health record. Okay, we did it ourselves. I myself recorded three hundred auscultations. I'm a doctor. We incorporated a lot of the local people, of the local staff. So there's a thousand recordings, well, a thousand children recorded, and then we quantified the quality of this, and it was very good. Okay, so in 2014 we validated that. It is possible without support, okay, and to do a new electronic health record, even by the personnel using the technology. Okay, uh, there we go. That's that's the team. Okay, this is one of the first days, so we still look uh, okay, pretty decent. If you have seen this picture on the last day, we both look horrible, and Christine actually looks amazing still. So I don't know, it's your secret, but me and Daniel look amazing, and so we. Okay, so we participated uh, two more times in this hard caravan, it happens every year. Okay, 2015, another landmark moment because we said, okay, next step, computer assisted decision. Let's put one on one, okay? Uh, proof of concept, we adapted the technology and we included uh, pulmonary hypertension. Okay, we went to the screen, at least this one, um, because pulmonary hypertension is a big deal in this region. And, you know, uh, if you, if you if you know a bit of this stuff, it's asymptomatic, okay, if it's congenital, okay, kids look normal, okay, because the heart, when it's going, is deformed to compensate. And at some point, five, six years, it does not compensate anymore, and you start getting symptoms, but the heart is already deformed and requires surgery. So this is a very serious problem in other in, in underprivileged, uh, underprivileged regions. Okay, so that's why we check this. It was a very successful proof of, proof of concept, so we've been working on lots of algorithms ever since. Okay, in July 16, we actually went that we installed the technology, trained the personnel, uh, so the network is now able to use the, this type of uh, 
the transportation part alongside all the technologies we already use. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what about algorithms and signal processing? Well, I guess, you know, uh, as a keynote, I thought I could talk about algorithms and formulas. I'm not going to do that. Okay, we've been actively pursuing these the algorithms and the signal processing. Okay, we, we've done for a very long time academic, okay, contributing to the body of knowledge. And now it's reaching the point where you can actually have algorithms with enough uh, clinical usefulness and with enough knowledge for patenting and for proper technology transfer and innovation. So we're addressing this now, uh, which was something we didn't do before. Okay? Our, our latest pattern is actually cooperation, for example, uh, with the electronics. But I don't have that one. I'll speak. On the next talk, I'll speak about that one. <laughs> um, but uh, we're, we're, we have organized that international challenge. We're now organizing uh, another international challenge with all these data from the hard caravans. That's 3,000 kids. Um, and uh, hopefully, with the coalition of computers and cardiology, the society. Um, and physiomet, so hopefully we'll have a big challenge there. Okay, but there's still a long way. So this is still something we're researching, and you know, our challenges. I'll speak later about what the challenges are associated with that. Okay, well, one of them is, is multimodality. Okay, so <clears throat> I honestly think the, the stethoscope will not die or will evolve a lot. Okay, and uh, one of the things is the electrocardiography. Okay, it's something that is there. Okay, um, it's, you can buy devices, for example, you can buy like producers such as Echo. Okay, the Echo Duo already claims that they get auscultation and the electrocardiography simultaneously. Okay, this is pretty interesting. For example, auscultation sometimes uh, it's extremely noisy. Okay, and the, the fact that the ECG is not so noisy gives you clues on exactly where the heart sounds are for more important analysis. Okay, uh, one of the things, uh, actually, the patterns that that I was not going to talk about, but I'm sure I'm very grateful for that. A few minutes there, uh, that we contributed to that was that uh, this, this is actually a device that, uh, that can link to an electronic stethoscope such as Lipton to not, not only give the additional ECG, but to actually give additional information such as rotation and you know, position. But if you use a system that, such as ours, that records where the, the focus, where you are recording the position, and then you go to rotation, okay? What we did was study, if you opportunistically gather these ECGs when you're doing an auscultation, okay, are they really interesting surrogates of conventional ECGs? And we found out that they're interesting surrogates of a fair amount, okay? So, so we patented this, um, and now are hopefully transferring to manufacturers, okay? Because that means that you don't waste additional time in their routine, where you do your auscultation, as a bonus. They will get their ECG and maybe detect some additional things or launch some warning. They say, hey, you should do a proper ECG now because there's all this food. But that's without spending an additional minute. Okay? As you see with the numbers uh, by Eric Topol, you know that there's a very small time on primary care, on this screening process. We don't have time. So if we could exploit these opportunities, then we probably have added value and better screening and hopefully the rest. Okay? The other <clears throat> future challenge that I'm very interested in is ultraportable ultrasound. I mean, uh, ultrasound is an additional, is the, the next layer of quality of cardiac screen. It's harder, okay, it requires more expert knowledge, it's typically more expensive, okay, but the, the dawn and the, the ultraportable, and it's something I can put around my neck and use as a stethoscope, is really um, an interesting development that can really take away screen disease in these environments. And honestly, my vision is that there will be no single modality. We will have in the future, I mean, I'll just put that in the chest, and I'll get the ECG, the, the, the sound, the ultrasound, etc. Okay? And my analysis, my uh, algorithmic analysis, will involve all these things. So that's the challenges I'm, I'm, I've decided to work on in the next decade. Okay? And, uh, uh, Michael was saying that people must just you know, uh, in long term, you know, this is my thinking long term. Hopefully, I'll not have uh, embarrassing moments like the last one by Elon Musk. But hey, you know, all these guys that risk and really, you know, take a stand, um, you know, they are the ones that get success, and sometimes they get embarrassed. So hey, you know, that that happens. 
but let uh, hopefully that will not stop you from risking and you know driving innovation. And, and so I leave you with that question. Okay, those are my future challenges. Those are my challenges for the, the next day. Like, what are yours? Risk, you know, take chances, be disruptive. Okay, because there's a lot of healthcare uh, problems in the world that uh, you know need to be addressed. I myself am in love with underprivileged areas. And that's the human side of it, but there's problems everywhere and we can really address them. Okay, so that's it. Uh, those are my contributions. Thank you, and hopefully, we'll work together. <laughs>
players, for the committees. And for example, one reason to look at it is that these screening processes, okay, um, from all of the stations, one of the stations was the involved, the parents, usually the mother was there with the child, and she has to enroll and everything is explained to her, and this is all made for free, and the cost is they allow to use the data for science. Okay? That's why we could use this data to train our algorithms and to anonymize, we'll hopefully launch an international challenge based on that data. That's, that's part of that. And then, of course, uh, at, at some point we reach the patent level. Okay? And then, as soon as you want to craft a new device, it's a whole new world. Okay. Uh, you have mentioned about a uh, single company, uh, which is called Success. Uh, well, how did um, you, uh, what did affect your focus other than that uh, you are maybe successful? Uh, what affected uh, main idea? <clears throat> uh, I, uh, how it affected my personal focus? Yes. Or, or, or group? Uh, yes. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, my dis uh, disruptive set is a, it's a common word. It's, it's, a, it's a, there's the before and the after. It's a huge change on mindsets, right? Because commonly thinks completely different. Commonly thinks money, otherwise it dies. Mm -hmm. And we as academics, the paper, science, helping the world, etc. Okay, so the the same people that are used to do the research are not necessarily the same people that can do the company. Okay, um, <clears throat> and and uh, you really, in my, in my opinion, you should really keep these processes separate. Okay, very quickly the team, even if it's part of the research, right, moves to a different place, thinks differently. And you should not confuse things. Okay? This is very important. Otherwise, things will get very mixed and they're going to hurt research and they're going to hurt company. Okay? So, but then this is a well established process okay, of how you should perform innovation. This is well established things. And you know, uh, follow those good guidelines because otherwise it gets strange very quickly. Uh, team morale goes crazy. Even the, the, the relationship with, with your partners. Hospitals are great to work with me. They're not so keen on working with the company, right? So the barrier, the legal barrier, has to be there. So we did this. We transferred all this to the company. So we registered all the intellectual property, you know, in the university that the company was formed and had the license. So this this has to be very very careful. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my thoughts on the subject. <laughs> um, actually, the, the acoustic stethoscope is more heavily filtered than the electronic one. It's filtered by acoustic filters uh, on, the, on the tip of the stethoscope. That's why you need to actually change because they have a different acoustic filter. So they're used to this muffled, full frequency sound. And usually, when you go to electronic stethoscopes, they are using digital filters, or they are not using filters at all. Because to say, hey, you listen to better. Commercial company. But the fact is that then uh, the sounds that you typically listen on an acoustic stethoscope and then the sounds you typically listen on a conventional electronic stethoscope can be pretty different because one is filtered and the other is poorly filtered. Okay? So, for example, we, we, when we record the data with electronic stethoscopes, we record without any filtering, and then when we create an educational product, we actually handcrafted filters that make it resemble as much as possible the sound of the human acoustic stethoscope because that's what doctors are trained to do. Okay. 
This is news. I mean, the, the, the original motivation for creating electronic stethoscopes was actually military. Okay, it's because uh, the paramedics used helicopters to retrieve soldiers, and then you cannot listen to anything there. So the the, the, the sound enhancement that you could use that was actually the driver for the for the first electronic stethoscopes. So the point was that you just to make it very loud, right? And then uh, what what I've seen, I know from personal experience that. Um, had, uh, cardiac, uh, actually, we've done some uh, studies on this. That the, 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 uh, cardi um, the pediatric cardi cardiology wards are extremely noisy. They will record noise levels of 70 decibels, which is like a motorway or, or a discotheque. Right? <laughs> and then we ask doctors to listen to these fine sounds uh, on that. It's really hard. Okay? And so, for example, in Brazil, a few doctors used to work on these stethoscopes just for long. Okay. But they had to adapt. The sound is different. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah. 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 But that's the sound, let's say, that the manufacturer is putting there, right? When you use your signal processing, you actually get the raw signals, right? <coughs> and then you do whatever you want with it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I think, and I agree with you, that's one of the reasons why they have been really um, being adopted more, because they change things. Right? Stability, uh, yeah. trust, etc. Okay, so with support of these newer systems, then the technology standards is much higher. People here, we are waiting to imagine them. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you very much.